are type two diabetics. This is not typically, does not usually show up in childhood. This usually occurs as, a, as an adult. There are cases of type two diabetes and in, this, in children, but in this, you have less insulin and the insulin that you make doesn't work. So this is really this kind of little picture diagram that I drew is really how glucose gets into your blood, into your cells. So glucose is in the bloodstream when you eat. Your body cells have what's called a receptor and a receptor is where insulin binds, okay? So it's almost like a lock. So on your body cells, you've got the lock. Well, insulin is the key. Once insulin is there, that opens the door and allows glucose to go into your body cells. If insulin's not there, then glucose doesn't, right? It's basically like locked out. So for some people, they don't have enough insulin. And for some people, the receptors do not bind the insulin as well. So that can be a factor too. So that's when they talk about insulin resistance, that you're developing insulin resistance. That means that your insulin is not working as well as it should. Maybe you're not making as much but a lot of times it's because there's actually less receptors. This is intimately tied to weight. So 80% of type two diabetics are overweight. And so when body fat goes up, insul insulin receptor numbers go down. So it is almost like a way of the body is trying to, to flip to burn more fat as a way of burning energy because of the higher body fat percentages. Some people that are overweight, even some people that are morbidly obese are not type two diabetics. But if you're overweight, you're at higher risk of developing. So just because you're overweight doesn't mean you're automatically a type two diabetic. But the older you get, the more wear and tear on your pancreas because whenever you're eating, and it's this idea that if you're overweight, then you're probably overeating in sugars. And so whenever sugar levels go up, that means you've got to have this much insulin to bring it down. So then you eat more requires this. So every time your pancreas is like putting out a lot of insulin, it can be kind of like burning itself out because of overuse, because of excessive amount of insulin secretion. So the type one diabetic, they typically don't develop the acid. They don't develop the, the coma. They don't have all of the problems like the life-threatening problems, but for them, that hyperglycemia is really the big issue. So they end up with, they start to notice problems that are related to that high blood sugar, heart disease risk, which is heart attack, stroke, hypertension because their blood sugar is higher than it should be. They have poor healing. They can develop kidney damage over time and end up having to be on dialysis. So the treatment for this is a little different. So with a type one diabetic, you have to give them insulin. They have to, right? So they, they're gonna be on insulin and monitor their blood sugar for the rest of their life. For a type two diabetic, they may need medication to help improve that insulin receptor interaction. So that's what some of the medications that are out there, but they have found a very effective treatment is even losing 10% of your body weight. So it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to end up being like lose 150 pounds, even losing 10% of your body weight as a type two diabetic shows return of insulin receptor function. So it's, Oftentimes it's a 20, 30, 40 pound difference where your pancreas can then manage the amount of sugar and the incidence of hyperglycemia decreases. So what they try to get you to do is just eat less carbs because carbohydrates get digested and end up becoming blood sugar. So eating less carbs and increasing exercise because that'll increase your calorie burned. So that means more burned calories is less stored calories and that's going to kind of give something for your cells to use carbohydrates for instead of just having them as circulating. They have found that if you drop body fat percentages, that there's actually a return and improvement in insulin and receptor binding. So some people, once they become type 2 diabetics, they need to take medications. Some type 2 diabetics end up taking insulin. My mother had to take insulin for a while. 
And then because of another medical complication, she lost about 35 pounds. She doesn't take insulin anymore. So she, and it wasn't like, you know, a, it wasn't a dramatic weight loss. You know, like you hear people lost a hundred pounds, 150 pounds, whatever. It wasn't a huge dramatic amount, but it actually brought her body fat percentages down. So she has better insulin receptor binding. So one way that they now look at your blood sugar, they look at it using what they call an A1C. So A1C levels are actually in a blood test, and it's a way of monitoring the amount of blood sugar in your red blood cells. So your red blood cells, they have a lifespan of about 120 days. So they live for about four months. They're made, they get shot out into the blood, they circulate for about three or three and a half months, and then they get kind of wrinkly looking, and then they'll get filtered and pulled out. So your bone marrow is always making blood cells. So they pull some blood and they actually monitor how much sugar is inside of those red blood cells because it actually shows like a three month average. If you had hyperglycemia the day this red blood cell was made, there will be more sugar in that red blood cell. And so it's sort of like a sampling. So if your A1C numbers are less than 5.7%, then that's considered normal. So most people's are like four, four and a half, all the way up to 5.7, fine. But above 5.7, they now call that pre-diabetes. What that means is you are having periods of time where you have hyperglycemia. So your blood sugar has been above normal for prolonged periods of time because it's all caught in those red blood cells. So anywhere from 5.7 to 6.4 now, that's where they say your risk factor is high. So you can bring it down with the diet and exercise aspect, but if it continues and goes over 6.4, then you're technically considered a diabetic. And they will want to put you on medication to try and reduce your hyperglycemia. So there's a bunch of different medicines. Some medicines help insulin and the receptors bind better. Some actually cause your kidneys to excrete sugar. So if your blood sugar is too high and you take this medicine, your kidneys will flush some of that sugar out of the bloodstream. So there's different ones to try and like balance that out. But for the type two diabetic, it's really like, this is the big, the big challenge. I mean, and like for my mother, it wasn't exercise. It was because she got really sick and like she couldn't eat for about two and a half months. So she lost like 35 pounds and that was just because of that, you know? So since then she has kind of kept it off. So she hasn't had to start taking insulin. She still takes like the metformin. She does take some of the insulin promoting types of drugs, but a lot of those have terrible side effects. People say that they just don't feel good, that there is taking that, the medications where it helps to flush glucose out of your blood in the kidneys that can give you like a horrendous infection like terrible infection. So some of the meds have some really negative side effects. So those are just the number of patients that you will see, even if you're in vet tech, like you end up taking care of the little, the little chubby dogs that come in, <laughs> whose, whose owners like feed them way too much table food and everything. And some of them are like type one diabetics. Some of them are skinny and active and you have to give them insulin or else their blood sugar like gets all out of control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you bring them in, you check their blood sugar, mm -hmm. dogs, cats. Mm -hmm. I had, I've had friends that dogs and cats that have had diabetes that they have given them insulin and learned to like test their blood sugar. It's a expensive though for a dog or a cat. Cause you have to come in and they have to like do it over like the whole day. So you have to get them in there first thing in the morning and they, they, feed them, then they monitor what does their blood sugar do. So like every hour they're drawing blood to see, is their blood sugar going up? Does their blood sugar level off? You give them insulin to see how quickly it goes down. So there's a lot, and that's a lot of like manpower. So it's like a couple hundred bucks to do an insulin study on a dog. So it's a challenge. It can really be a challenge, but this is like, if you're going into human healthcare, I guarantee half your patients are diabetics guarantee because what happens if they get sick and they have poor blood flow that they already have kidney damage that they have the neuropathy poor circulation 
So if something else happens to them, this is what they call a comorbidity, right? So this means it's gonna make it even harder for them to get better because they don't have good blood flow. So how are you going to have this wound on your leg heal if you don't have good circulation? So then that wound like stays infected and now it gets worse. And now you've got like your septic because of that infection. So there's having diabetes put you at risk for a whole host of other health concerns too. It's not just, well, I got to watch what I eat kind of thing. It's not, it's really not that simple. There's a, an awful lot to it, but hyperglycemia is really kind of like the, the chronic damager having high blood sugar leads to all of this cardiovascular issues that ends up touching on really like everything else. All right. So other sugars. So sugar, so glucose, I said, D-glucose, most abundant monosaccharide. Galactose is only one chiral carbon different. So remember we said that glucose is like alcohols on the right, the left, the right, the right. Okay, if you were going down D-glucose, the alcohol group on carbon two is on the right, carbon three on the left, carbon four and five, it's on the right. But notice galactose, carbon four is switched. It's the only thing that's different between it and glucose. Galactose is part of milk sugar. So lactose is made of glucose and galactose combined. And that's pretty much its only use or only place that it's found is being part of milk sugar. One that you may have not heard of is called mannose. Mannose is interesting because it's found in cranberries. So when you eat cranberries or cranberry juice or cranberry sauce, mannose gets absorbed, but it actually gets flushed out. So rather than being maintained, it goes into the GI tract. It gets absorbed in the small intestine, but then it gets filtered out by your kidneys. So we really don't use it for energy, but on its way out through the urinary tract, mannose can actually bind to bacteria. So as mannose is exiting the body from the kidneys to the ureters to the bladder, out the urethra, out the urinary tract, it actually can attract bacteria. So if you have ever had a UTI, what do they tell you to drink? cranberry juice. So it's not just like an old wives tale. It's because of the sugar found in cranberries actually helps to flush bacteria out of the urinary tract. But if you look at it, what is this? Is this a hexose or a pentose? Mm -hmm. So see one, two, three, four, five, and there's six, right? So remember every cross is a carbon. So this would be a hexose. And is it an aldehyde or a ketone? Aldehyde. aldehyde. So this would be an aldohexose. Okay. So this one's pretty easy. Just when, if you're going to identify what kind of sugar something is, just count the number of carbons. For the most part with us, it's either a pentose or a hexose. Those are the more common monosaccharides. And if the double bond oxygen's on the end, it's an aldo. If the double bond oxygen's on carbon two, then that is a keto. Okay, so fructose. So what is fructose? Mm -hmm. So what, how would you describe what kind of sugar this is? How many carbons? Count all of them. Mm -hmm. There's six. Can you see that? So counting from the top, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it is also a hexose, but this one is a keto hexose. See the double bond oxygen on carbon two? So that makes it a keto hexose. So fructose is really the, the big ketose that we talk about. It is one that you find in honey, okay? So I always think of, of, of fructose as being like fruit sugar. Fructose sounds like fruit. So fructose is a fruit sugar. It's in combination found in fruits, honey. Fructose and glucose are what makes sucrose. So table sugar is sucrose. So that's why it's pretty common. Fructose is the sweetest of all the sugars.
So we'll talk a little bit about this in the next, uh, after this part. So now this, here's ribose and deoxyribose. So how many sugar, how many carbons? So that makes this a pentose. Mm -hmm. Is it an aldo or a keto? Mm -hmm. So there's an aldehyde, see the double bond oxygen on the end. So that's an aldo pentose. Where have you heard ribose and deoxyribose? Uh huh. What? DNA. Yeah, DNA. When you think of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So the D of DNA tells you this sugar is in it. Deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. So it has this sugar. So do you tell me there's only one difference between these two? Deoxyribose is missing a... Mm -hmm. Instead of an OH, it just has an H. So it's missing an oxygen. It's been deoxied. D is like removed. So it's been deoxied. It's got one less oxygen than what ribose has. So that's how its name came about. So this is the sugar you find in DNA. This is the sugar that you find in RNA. If you ever take a multivitamin and you see riboflavin written, riboflavin, ribo, has ribose in it, okay? So riboflavin is actually B2. It's one of your B vitamins. So there is a component in a vitamin that is made with this sugar. So, oh, I forgot that. So most monosaccharides, we've been drawing them looking like they're straight lines, but in fact, they're not, okay? And it all has to do with that double bond. So the aldo or the keto or that double bond oxygen, remember double bonds are more reactive than single bonds. So these pentoses and hexoses, so whether we're talking about, and we're really just going to talk about glucose and give galactose as an example, but these sugars want to Break that double bond, break that aldehyde or ketone double bond oxygen. And doing this, they form a ring. And so you may have seen them drawn, sugars like drawn like this. So it looks like it's got a ring and that ring has an oxygen in there. So that is when the straight chain forms a ring because notice now there's no double bond. So by breaking that double bond, it actually creates a more stable molecule in this ring shape. So here's how it does it. I tried to make this bigger so you could see it. So this first one, D-glucose, right? So this is glucose in the straight chain. When these carbons, remember that they have this ability to rotate. So like single bonds can rotate. If you take and bend this chain, carbon one and carbon five, their oxygens sit side by side. Like I said, I, I have them. They're just upstairs in the lab. I forgot to bring them. I had two of them. So they're like this, but when they bend, remember how you have, you can have single bonds rotate. Carbon one up at the top, that red oxygen, and the carbon five, the blue oxygen, they get really close. So that red oxygen with the double bond can open. So if the double bond opens up, and it takes the hydrogen off of carbon five's alcohol. So in seeing this, see how this looks like it's opening up? And that means now this, that hydrogen is transferred over to carbon one and carbon five's alcohol loses its oxygen and it goes to, links onto carbon number one. So we make this ring, carbon one now has an alcohol group two, three, and four all have alcohols on them, but five doesn't anymore because five's oxygen, uh, um, alcohol is now part of the ring. So this, that was the OH on carbon number five. That's what that oxygen was. It lost its hydrogen to carbon number one. All the other carbons have alcohol groups except carbon number five now. And notice here, there's no double bonds. That actually creates a little more stable. So a couple of things. 
depending on the way the ring closes. So when the ring closes, if carbon number one, if its alcohol group points down, they call that the alpha form. So see how this OH is pointing down? That is the alpha ring shape. And they'll put a little alpha symbol. Remember like alpha decay? So it's that funny looking little A thing. Whereas if the alcohol group is pointing up, they call that the beta. And they'll use the B. Remember the B with the little foot to it? Like beta decay? So it looks just like those symbols for alpha and beta decay when we were talking about radioactive decay back in chapter 2. Notice that this is a double arrow. It's reversible. So this ring can open and close and open and close. When it opens, it goes back into the straight chain. When it closes, the alcohol group can be up, which is beta, or it could be down, which is alpha. It just depends on like how it closes up. So you can have either. So there are just two possible ways that that alcohol group ends up being positioned, either pointing up or pointing down. Which OH are you looking at? Uh-huh. See the one right here? This one. Off of carbon one. Okay. Right? See how that one's pointing down, and then here it's pointing up? So the OH, huh? The OH here is, ang is angled downward. Here, the OH is coming up. Okay, so if it's pointing down, that's alpha. If it's pointing up, that's beta. So that is why they would call that alpha deglucose or beta deglucose. Alpha deglucose tells you the alcohol group is pointing down off of carbon one. Beta deglucose means the alcohol group is pointing up. Okay, so we'll do an alpha. So here's kind of like the steps, and I may have written this out a little bit differently than what you have it on your PowerPoint, but I just tried to like, and I don't expect you to draw this. I just want you to see how they are done. So the first way that I would always say is you start with by putting the carbonyl carbon, that's the carbon with the double bond oxygen. So this, that in this case, it's carbon one. If it was a ketose, it'd be carbon two, but whichever one has the double bond oxygen, it always goes over here. It's always going to go kind of like on the far right side of the molecule. So it's going to always like your right point. That's carbon number one. Then it says, put the rest of the carbon chain down. So you make an upside down question mark. So carbon one is here. So come down at an angle to make carbon two. Then go straight across to make carbon three. Then go up and make carbon four. Carbon four should be across from carbon one. So they should be kind of like evenly across. Then come up. So you're going to carbon five and that should be kind of like above carbon three. Carbon six is up here and it's not chiral. So you just write it out, right? So remember if it's not chiral, it's not a certain specific, it's just CH2OH. So that one's up at the top. So now, like I said, carbon five, which is this one, its oxygen forms a connection between carbon five and carbon one. That's what finishes the hexagon. So this blue oxygen right here is now what's here. So it's this oxygen is this. I can even change it and make it look blue. Well, not if I can't erase. So this oxygen is this oxygen. Okay, so do you see how I say it looks like an upside down question mark? So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, like upside down question mark kind of look. And then just link carbon one and five with an oxygen. Now on each, on everything in the ring, the position of the alcohol and the hydrogens are like locked into place. So remember when we had to make ring structures, we had the cis and the trans. So things that point down get stuck pointing down. Things that point up are stuck that way. So if we're going to do alpha, 
off of carbon one, that means that we are going to have the alcohol group pointing down. So OH points down, and that is because this is alpha. That means that a hydrogen sticks up, because remember carbon has to have four bonds. Carbon one, two, three, and four are all gonna have an oxygen, or an alcohol and a hydrogen. So this one's carbon one. Now carbon number two, three, four, are all going to have the OH, or sorry, the groups that are on this side, these will all point down. So on carbon number two, I'll have an OH. Carbon number three will have an H. Carbon number four will have an OH. So if you look at the straight chain, everything on the right side will end up pointing down in those middle chiral carbons. Everything on the left is going to end up pointing up. So that means carbon number two will have a hydrogen sticking up. Carbon number three has an OH sticking up. Carbon number four has an H sticking up. So carbon five only has a hydrogen. Do you see that it shows three? So the fourth, the fourth bond for carbon number five is a hydrogen and it hangs down. So that's like alpha deglucose. So I won't ask you to draw this, but if you see a sugar, you should be, remember, look on the far right carbon. If it points down, you know it's an alpha form. If it points up, you know it's beta. So that's one thing. If you were comparing these two, you can say this and this match because the carbon's in the middle, any alcohol or hydrogens that stick to the, are off the right side will always point down. Any that are on the left side will always point up. So that's alpha deglucose. So when we have more than one glucose linking together, we can form a link between them. It is a condensation reaction. So remember in a condensation reaction, this is where you're gonna form water. You are going to pull an OH and an H off of two molecules. And by doing that, you'll link them together. Right, so you're gonna pull an H off of one of these molecules, you're gonna pull an OH off of the other, and in doing that, you're gonna form the bond that holds them together. So look at these two. So this is both. Do you see that this is alpha? It's an alpha because see that that far right carbon has an OH pointing down, that's an alpha. So that's alpha deglucose. If I have two alpha deglucoses, I pull an alcohol group off of one carbon on one glucose, pull hydrogen off of the other. This oxygen now becomes the bridge to link them together. So that's an ether bond. They call it a glycosidic bond. So any bonds between sugars are glycosidic. So like glyco is like sugar. So a glycosidic bond is a bond between sugars. So notice how the bond kind of makes this V. That always happens if you have an alpha sugar. So see the OH sticks down. So when it forms the link, now they're both kind of pointing down. So your alpha linkages are typically this V kind of shape or appearance. And this makes maltose. So this is the first disaccharide we're gonna talk about. Maltose is what you find is a grain sugar. So they call this a disaccharide because now it's two sugars. So the one on the left is maltose. The one on the right is cell bios. So the one on the left, see the link. See the kind of link. 
Now they call that link an alpha one to four glycosidic bond. So why is it alpha one to four? So it's alpha one to four because the left glucose is an alpha glucose. So notice it's OH was sticking down. So this was the alpha and it's one to four because what? What's, it's because carbon one on the left sugar is linked to carbon four on the right sugar. Do you see that? So they're like sitting side by side, carbon one on the left sugar is linked to carbon four on the right. So that's what one to four means. It's just telling you which sugars, which carbons on the two sugars are connected. Okay, so look at the cell bios. So this is a beta one to four glycosidic bond. Why is it beta? Mm -hmm. Because again, if you always look at like the left sugar, right? So if the left sugar is sticking up, that's a beta. It was a beta glucose. That was beta D glucose. So remember going this direction, that's beta. Whereas over on the other side, see where it's going down? That's alpha. So going up, if your left sugar is going up, that's beta. If your left sugar is going down, that's alpha. And these ones, whenever you're linking like end to end, carbon one to carbon four, that's a one to four. So cell bios is like one that's artificially made. But maltose, I said maltose, they sometimes call it malt sugar. This is a grain sugar. So wheat, barley, a lot of grains store a little bit of sugar in their grain because remember, this is a seed. So if you have a little grain of barley or wheat, that is like a little fertilized embryo. So all you have to do is put it in soil and add water and it'll grow and form a new plant. So this is one of the nutrients that the plant packs into the seed so that the little embryo has something to use until it can make its own energy. So you'll have stuff in there. There'll be, there'll be starchy material in grain, but there's also some sugar that's in there. No, it's really bright. <laughs> it's like the last ditch efforts. So just remember maltose. I always think of like Schlitz malt liquor. <laughs> I always think of malt as like beer sugar. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's in high concentration in wheat as well as barley. And barley, roasted barley is typically what's used in fermentation into alcohol. Okay, here's the second one. So maltose is like grain sugar. Lactose is found in milk. Mm -hmm. So they call this milk sugar. So now looking at this, look at the left sugar. Is the line going up or down? up. So remember, if it's going up, we know that's beta. So the left sugar, if the angle is going upward, it's beta. If it's going down, it's alpha. And this is linking what? Carbons one, two, four. So again, it's still linking them side by side. So the only difference between this and that cell bios is this, the left one is glucose. The right one is galactose. So this is where glucose and galactose are, are joined together. Sorry, this one's galactose. And I know because I look at that OH, it's sticking up and in glucose, it sticks down. So this is glucose. So these two are joined together to make milk sugar. And the enzyme lactase breaks this, speeds up the breakdown of lactose into these two sugars. So remember we talked about lactose intolerance. First one is galactose. First one is galactose. And I can actually tell, notice that OH is sticking up. Because remember, that's carbon number four. That's the one that was different with galactose compared to glucose. So carbon one is connected to carbon four because they're, again, the two ends are kind of connected. Like if you think of the two sugars, like the left side and the right side are connected directly. So that's an alpha or a beta one to four. You always look at the left sugar to figure out if it's beta or if it's alpha, because that's the one that's carbon one. 
third one. Third one is sucrose. So sucrose is a little different looking because sucrose, you see how it looks like it's stacked one on top of the other? Sucrose is table sugar. This is sugar that is extracted from sugar cane or sugar beets. So they extract it, crystallize. It's the sugar that you've got, like when you buy a bag of sugar, it is sucrose. So sucrose is glucose and fructose. But notice how they, instead of being side by side, they are joined this way. And in fact, the carbon one of each of those is what gets linked. So it's not carbon one and four, but it's actually carbon one and carbon two. So carbon one of glucose. So remember that this was carbon one. This was this, right? Because remember it was an aldehyde. So glucose had that double bond oxygen on the end. So carbon one is the one that had the double bond. But down at the bottom, the, the fructose molecule, remember that it's a ketohexose. So this carbon number two was the one that had the double bond oxygen. So when these two get linked, they call this carbon one is alpha pointing down off of the glucose, but the carbon two off of fructose is sticking up. So this is why they call it an alpha beta. So you have both both the alpha and the beta, and it's one to two because it's linking carbon one on the top sugar to carbon two on the bottom sugar. So it's sort of a different looking one. It'll always, it looks like stacked. Sweetness scales, but there's the example. So there's the one, and it is, I did finally go back and draw it the right way. So this first one, you should be able to look at these and tell me what kind of glycosidic bond is this. So the trick is, so remember that look at, look at the left sugar. Okay, because the left sugar is always gonna be where your carbon one is. So look at the left sugar if the angle coming off to the oxygen is up, that's what? Up is beta. Mm -hmm. If it's coming down, you know then it's alpha. Then figure out which carbons are being connected. So you just number them. So in this first one, look at the left sugar. Is that alpha or beta? It's alpha. Right, so I know that this is alpha and it's connecting carbons what? One, because the left sugar, this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I was numbering, remember you'd number like upside down question mark. But then I got to number the, the one that's down below. Where do I start my one? In that same spot. So this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is alpha one, two, six. Does that make sense? So I'm connecting carbon one of the left sugar to carbon six of the right sugar. So look at the one that's like up and to the right. So in that one, look at the left sugar, which way does it angle? Well, it comes up. Do you see that? This is the example I showed you where I said it looks like a zigzag. So this, do you see how this puts them side by side? Okay. But when you look at the the angle of the bond, you can see it's at a diagonal. So if you see the diagonal, okay, so this one, because that left sugar, the angle goes up, this is what? Beta. And it's connecting carbons what? One and four. Mm -hmm. So it's connecting like the right carbon on the left sugar and the, the left carbon on the right sugar. So it's like connecting them. They look like they're side by side. So a book will put it like that just to be able to, instead of having them like this, it brings them, it takes up less room on a page. What about the bottom one? Alpha, Alpha what? One and four. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way of drawing alpha. So instead of a V, this one looks kind of like a U. And again, it just is just different ways that different drawing systems use. So if you see that, don't let that throw you. So this and this, same thing. 
okay? Like a V shape or a U shape with that oxygen. So these are the same. And then also this and this, same thing. It's just different ways of drawing the same glycosidic bond. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So you tell me this one. <laughs> okay. First, you got to pick which one has, that's not an alpha beta, which one of these is the oxygen connected to carbon one, the top one or the bottom one? The bottom one, right? So remember this is carbon one. So this is the one that you want to start your numbering. Okay, because that's the one that used to be the double bond oxygen, not the one above. So it's the one below that used to be the double bond oxygen. So that means that what was its shape? Was it alpha or beta? Pointing up is beta. Mm -hmm. So this is beta connecting carbon one and carbon what? Two. Mm -hmm. So you see that's alpha and beta connecting carbon one and carbon two or sorry, not alpha, beta, but just beta. Then this bottom one. Mm -hmm. Bottom one is beta, right? Because it's going up. Connecting one and four. Because mm -hmm. they're still side by side. So now this one that has six sugars. So this leads us into the polysaccharides because this is what you're going to see. It's not just two sugars. Now there's actually six sugars. So some of the sugars, like this one, what's this? Alpha what? One to four, right? Because they're just attached side by side and they've got a U, the V shape. So those are alpha one to four. But then what's this one? Same thing. This one, same thing. Mm -hmm. Do you see that even this one is the same thing? That all of those are alpha one to four. That just creates these glucoses that are like side by side in this long chain. Very common in starch. But then how's this one different? It's a, no. So again, in that one, you've got to find where's carbon one. Where's carbon one? Is it on the top one or the bottom one? See that this is the top one, so that's carbon one. So that's the one that you want to look at to see if it's pointing up or down. And so that one is pointing which way? Down, so it is alpha, and it's connecting carbon one and... Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, this one's six, right? So see it going around the upside down question mark? So this would be an alpha one to six. So they call that a branching, a branching bond, because you'll have this long chain of alpha one to four, and then you'll have an alpha one to six that creates a branch. Mm -hmm. Because this is carbon one, right? So the one up here, that's carbon two. So find carbon one, and that determines if it's alpha or beta. So if you have two linked together, one of them is going to be the one that used to be the double bond oxygen. So find carbon one. So it doesn't matter if one's above the other or vice versa. Find carbon one in both example in the example, and then determine if it goes down, that was alpha. If it goes up, then that's beta. Okay? And then figure out what it's attached to on the other sugar. Because that one, it's attached to carbon two. Carbon two is not the double bond oxygen. Right? So carbon two was just an alcohol group that ended up being connected. And then the one over there, carbon one is the upper, so the one that I'm talking about here, carbon one is the one above because that's carbon one. And then going down, it connects to carbon six. So carbon one is going to be your, the, what they call the anomeric carbon. It's just the carbon that used to be the double bond oxygen. That's the one when it closes, that's what determines if it's alpha or beta. Okay. 
the glycosidic bond. That, huh? Naming or identifying the glycosidic bond. So any bond in a sugar is a glycosidic bond. But you can name which carbons are connected based on the position that the alcohol had on the two sugars when they joined. So then this leads us into the last group. So now we've got the polysaccharides. So poly means many. So when we talked about mono and disaccharides, we said they're one sugar, two sugar. These, we are talking about hundreds to even thousands of glucose units. So poly is many. So I'm gonna split these into two groups. We're gonna talk about the digestible polysaccharides. And then we'll talk about the undigestible polysaccharides. So digestible polysaccharides means that you can break these molecules down. So starch is the first one. So starch is found in granules of plant cells. So they are in all of your grains, rice, corn, potatoes. So that includes things like all of your breads, pasta. They are all going to have contains different types of starch. So wheat makes a starch, oats make starch, barley makes starch, rice, potatoes, So really, starch is a mixture. So starch is kind of a general term. It's a mixture of two polysaccharides. The first one is called amylose. So amylose is, and it is about 20% of starch. Only about 20% of starch makes up am, is made of amylose. And it's anywhere from 250 to 4,000 glucose molecules. So it is a chain all connected in a long continuous chain of alpha one to four. So alpha one to four, does it look like a V or a zigzag? Mm -hmm. So alpha, if I drew a little glucose molecule looking like that, right? Just not putting in all of the parts, a V is the link. So these are connected, that would be two. Then I'd have to do another one a little hexagon with the oxygen in the upper right corner, that's three. I'd have to do 250 to 4,000 of those. <laughs> Every single one connected by an alpha one to four linkage. So huge in comparison to like glucose, comparison to sucrose. These are really large molecules. Amylopectin is kind of like amylose, but it has a branching system. So amylopectin is really about 80% of starch. So it starts off as a chain of alpha one to four, but then it has branches about every 25 glucoses. So if I had, and I'd have to draw 25 glucoses, which is a lot, I'll just draw glucose as a circle to try and make it look simpler. <laughs> See, each one of these is a glucose. If I have 25 glucoses all linked by alpha one to four bonds, when I get past that 25th, I'll have a branch. And that branch has alpha one to four, but the branch is in alpha one to six. So that's this branch, and now I can have a long chain. Do you see how this can kind of almost look like a tree? Okay, it's kind of like ends up being this chain with these branches. And if the branches are long, then the branches can have branches. So you can end up with this sort of like intricate shape this molecule that can have this branch and this, and then this branch, and then, then you can have branches and branches coming off of here. So this molecule gets pretty big. Size-wise, this is, again, can be in the thousands of glucose units. So it makes this really large branched structure. But you make an enzyme called amylase, and amylase breaks alpha one to four bonds. So we digest it. So we can break alpha one to four, and we can break alpha one to six. So we make enzymes 
that can break this down. So that means if you eat a molecule of amylose, it'll take a while, but all of those sugars can be broken down into single sugar units. So we make an enzyme to be able to digest this. So that's why if you eat grains, potatoes, rice, pasta, bread, you ingest it, it gets broken down and you can absorb all the glucose out of that molecule. So here's sort of like the alpha, the um, alpha one to four. So amylose, pretty big. It actually tends to make a coil. So see the chain they did in like yellow? They did one in like just, just a long chain just to show you that they would be glucose, linked to glucose, linked to glucose. All those would be alpha one to four. But when you have these, because of this shape, they tend to form a chain, which is kind of an interesting looking coil that they form. So when you eat anything that's this, if you eat any kind of starch or amylose, enzymes in your saliva actually start this digestion. So these enzymes begin to break up the chain. So you break it and you break it and you break it. And first it just randomly gets broken along the chain. So it gets broken from a really big sugar into smaller and smaller pieces of many sugars. And then those begin to get broken down and those get broken down. And eventually it will get all the way down to where you have individual glucoses. And that is when they get absorbed. So you'll have breakdown occur, more breakdown occur, and eventually you'll have monosaccharides. And when you get to the monosaccharide stage, then you can absorb it. So it has to get broken down all the way down to single little circles, single little glucose units. You can't absorb anything bigger. It won't go through the lining in the GI tract. So you have amylase in your saliva. You even have amylase secreted as part of your pancreatic juice. Those help to break the links between the sugars. This is going to take a while. So this is why when you eat a starchy food, it typically takes three to four hours before you begin to see a change in blood sugar. Because remember, this is sugar. It's still glucose. So once you absorb it, it does affect your blood sugar, but it doesn't affect it quickly like the simple sugars. When you eat simple sugars, you see a change that can happen like in minutes. You can start to see a change in blood sugar. So here, it's a much slower, steady increase. But if you were looking at blood sugar over time, it would increase it. Now, if you have a functioning pancreas, what gets kicked in? What gets secreted if your pancreas works? Your blood sugar goes over 110 and your pancreas makes insulin. insulin. And that helps keep it from going too high, right? But if you don't have insulin, even eating starches, your blood sugar can end up going above what it needs to be. So simple sugars are not the only thing that a diabetic has to look at. Simple sugars can change it really fast, but complex carbohydrates can still cause it to get into the range of that hyperglycemia. So monitoring both kinds of carbohydrates, not just sweets. You've also got to watch the breads, the cereals, the pasta, the potatoes, because those also can have a dramatic effect on blood sugar over a period of time. So when looking at amylopectin, so I kind of like this point, this picture. So this is the majority of starch, it's amylopectin. And so see how it kind of looks like this big branched thing? So lots of alpha one to four, but also every 25 glucoses, you have an alpha one to six. So you end up with a branch off of the chain and then those get big and you have branches. So again, remember this can be thousands of glucoses. We digest these too. We can break alpha one to four, we can break alpha one to six, but in doing so, it means we're, di we're absorbing glucose. So those are the starches.
So diabetics need to monitor starch as well as sugar. Because both of those can have an effect on blood sugar. Starches are just a little slower, but they can still raise your blood sugar. So here's the other one. So there's another digestible sugar, or polysaccharide, sorry, it's not a sugar. Another digestible polysaccharide, it's called glycogen. So glycogen, though, is not found in plants. Glycogen is found in animals. So starch is in plants, right? It's in the seeds of things, it's in grains. So all of our examples of starches you saw, those are all plants. This is how animals produce a polysaccharide. So animals take sugar and store it for in-between meal times. So animals can store blood sugar as glycogen. Most glycogen is stored in your liver and skeletal muscles. It looks almost identical to amylopectin, so that's branched. So it's branched, except it's a little more branched. It's about twice as branched as, as amylopectin is. But when we looked at this one back here, you can kind of think glycogen looks a lot like this. Glycogen looks a lot like this branched chain of glucose. It's just actually more branched. Glycogen production, since we're animals, we make glycogen. So we, we under the influence of insulin, so when you eat, remember I told you, so you eat something with a carbohydrate, you break it down, you absorb that glucose, your glucose goes up. Insulin secretes from the pancreas, which starts to bring your, glu your, your blood sugar down. As it comes down, one other thing that your insulin does is it tells your liver and skeletal muscles, take excess glucose out of the blood and store it as glycogen. I always think of glycogen as your in-between meal sugar source. So it's a way for you to store sugar for the times that you're not eating. So when are you not eating every four hours? When you're sleeping. So glycogen is kind of like your blood sugar regulation method for while you're asleep. So if you're not eating, then over time, your blood sugar starts to come down. Well, remember I said, if your blood sugar goes below 60, then you start getting shaky. You might start feeling kind of dizzy. You start like, it's difficult to concentrate. Hypoglycemia is an issue, just like hyperglycemia. So glycogen is there for when your blood sugar starts to go below 60. Then this can get broken down. And when it gets broken down, it releases glucose into the blood. So it helps to keep your blood sugar from dropping too low in between any type of eating. So it helps to maintain a constant glucose when sugars are not being consumed. And I always think of like when you're asleep. Because most people sleep for six to seven hours. And so during that time, your blood sugar would actually drop too low because you're still doing metabolism. Your cells are still needing sugar. So a lot of people that are athletes, if they have a game or they have a marathon or they have some kind of activity where they're going to need a lot of energy the next day, they will usually eat a higher carbohydrate meal the night before to try and maximize the amount of glycogen they have. So that way, if they're out running, they don't have time to eat because they're exercising for three, four hours in a, in a game or in some kind of competition. They may burn a lot of their blood sugar. So their blood sugar, instead of going down, it can actually access glucose from glycogen. So I just think of it as kind of a storage form or a way that animals can kind of maintain blood sugar during times that they're not eating. So here's a picture that kind of shows the three of them. 
So these two, these are starch. So these are your flour, grain, pasta, bread, cereal, all of those things. That's your starch is composed of these two. Amylose is just a chain. Amylopectin does have some branching. We digest that, no problem. Glycogen is what we actually make as a way of storing blood sugar. But it looks a lot like amylopectin. It's just actually more branched than amylopectin is. So those are digestible. These, we can break them. We can break glycogen down. We can make glycogen because we're animals. Starch, we can't, we can break it down. We can't make it because we're not plants, but we can digest it. We can break it down and use it for energy. So now what about fiber? So this is the non-digestible polysaccharides. So it's not digestible. So you remember that the bonds for starch and for glycogen are alpha 1 to 4 and alpha 1 to 6. We can make those bonds. We can break those bonds. Cellulose is beta 1 to 4. So let me blow this up just a little bit. See if my new updated computer, oh well, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't do it. <laughs> but if you look at this, it's such a challenge to look at and not be able to, I should, we should have just blown this one picture up. Nope. Nope, I don't know how to make it. It won't, it just won't. It used to hold that. Like I used to be able to zoom and it would stay, but now it won't stay. So in this one though, what I want you to look at is looking at this type of bond. So a beta one to four, the glucoses that they show, when you look at this bond, can you see that it looks like one, the bond goes up, which is, this is beta. So the bond here goes up, but the glucose that's next to it, they flip it upside down. So that look, makes it look like an upside down V, but it's actually not, it's actually angled correctly, but I just flipped the second glucose down. The third glucose is turned straight, so that's why it ends up having this, it creates this totally straight line that allows chains of glucose to line up and create like fibers. So that one picture, that green picture is like an electron microscope picture of cellulose, which is like cotton or bark from a tree. And so you can actually see these strands in it. Those strands are that tight packing of the chains of glucose and that helps to create this super strong structure. The whole reason you can have a tree 60 feet tall is because of cellulose. So the fibers of cellulose strengthen the wood and form a really rigid structure. We don't make this, right? We don't make cellulose or fiber. So we're much more flexible and bendy than plants are. Cellulose is built around cell structures. It's part of their cell wall, and it's part of the bark on trees. So it helps to create this really sort of tough, fibrous material. And the other big kicker is we don't make the enzyme to break a beta 1 to 4 bond. So remember, we can break alphas, but we don't make the enzyme to break a beta 1 to 4 bond. So that means that when you eat this, like you're like, I don't eat tree bark and I don't eat cotton. <laughs> well, you actually do. If you eat any bran flakes, you do. <laughs> because that's kind of like what a lot of, there's a large amount of fiber in things like that. So there is two kinds of fiber. So there is fiber that is called soluble. And it's because the, the fibers are not as tightly packed. So this when it gets heated, will kind of loosen, and so it forms more of a gel. So I always think about oatmeal. So have you ever had oatmeal? Everybody here has had oatmeal, yes. You know how oatmeal has almost like a gravy kind of taste to it? 
Like it's got like this sort of gel kind of material. I mean, I like oatmeal, oatmeal's fine, but you have to kind of think like the texture of it. It's got this kind of gel-like taste to it. That's soluble fiber. So when you boil the oats, the fiber in the oats softens and thickens and creates that. It helps to make you stay full because it soaks up water. So it actually swells in your stomach. It helps you feel full. And they have shown that it actually helps to slow sugar and cholesterol absorption. So if you're gonna eat some bacon, have some oatmeal with it. <laughs> so it helps to slow the absorption of sugar and cholesterol and it can help you feel full. So that's a benefit, especially for people that are like trying to maintain and regulate blood sugar. Oats, oatmeal, beans. So I don't know, like if you've had refried beans, you know, like the texture of them. So they're kind of thick, the refried beans. Apples, like if you ever had like baked apples, you know how apples can have, they'll get that kind of gel-like taste to them. Even carrots, when carrots are cooked, They'll get sort of soft, mushy, but they're, they still, they'll get like this kind of gel taste to them. All that soluble fiber. But the thing to remember, there's no calories in fiber because you don't digest it. So what happens? It doesn't get digested. It doesn't get absorbed. It passes through you. The other kind of insoluble fiber though, insoluble fiber is where those strands of glucose are tightly packed. They don't absorb water. Most insoluble fiber are the covers on grains. So if you think about like corn, if you think about like brown rice, the potato, like if you, if you get a potato from the store, it can sit like in the, in the vegetable bin for like months, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it seems like at least a month. It can just sit there, it doesn't dry out. Why? Because it has a cover on it. The peel on the potato is insoluble fiber. So it really creates almost like this waterproof cover on vegetables and fruit. Apples, oranges, all have this insoluble fiber. It protects the, the fruit, it protects the seed. But if we eat it, it doesn't absorb water and it doesn't get digested. So it has much more of a laxative effect. So it actually helps to add bulk to the food that's in your large intestine. Things like whole grains, seeds, brown rice, cabbage. Cabbage has a lot of insoluble fiber in it. All of the skins on your fruits and vegetables. Those are all things you can think of as being an insoluble fiber. They don't get digested. It doesn't like soften. It really just like moves through you. The reason that this is helpful or important, increasing or adding fiber to your diet helps to reduce your risk of colon cancer. So your colon is your large intestine. So the large intestine, it's basically the last four feet of your gastrointestinal tract, your DI, GI tract, or your, your digestive tract, the last four feet the job of the large intestine is to just absorb water, collect unabsorbed material into solid form, and then move it out. And so for most people on a daily basis, this your colon, the large intestine, goes through this series of contractions so that it actually pushes unabsorbed material into a more solid form. It absorbs water out of that solid material and it moves it along. So you get like this kind of like contractile motion that occurs. And for most people, it actually occurs on a pretty regular basis. And that even for some people, it's like same time every day, like you poop every day. So you have like this sort of like cycle that occurs. Most of the time it coordinates with your diet. When you eat, then it's much more common. I think of it, your large intestines trying to move things out to make room for what's coming in <laughs> because you've eaten. So you need to actually move stuff along unabsorbed material that doesn't have very much fiber will stay in the large intestine. So then you got to think about, okay, well, what's not absorbed? Unabsorbed material, you absorb carbohydrates, you absorb fats, right? And oils, you absorb water, you absorb salts, you absorb proteins once they get digested. We haven't talked about them yet, but you do absorb those. So what's left? What's left in your food? If you take out carbohydrates, salts, water, proteins, fats, oils, what's left?
preservatives, artificial flavors, artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, all of these things, they're not nutrients. We don't absorb them. So these things, if you don't have any fiber in your diet, these things stay in your large intestine. So they're artificial. And so some of them have been found that they can cause irritation to the wall of the large intestine if they stay there for a prolonged period of time. So how does your large intestine respond to this irritation? It may form a polyp. So a polyp is just where you have a growth. It looks almost like a mole. You get a growth on the surface of the large intestine. Some of those polyps can actually grow pretty big. So your large intestine is roughly about an inch and a half in diameter. So the opening of the hole is about like this. So if you get a polyp that's now like this, what's that gonna do to the tube? So if your polyp looks like this, so here's your tube and stuff has to go through and now you got this polyp that's this big. Yeah, it can create a blockage, okay? So it can affect how well things do move through. That means this stuff hangs out even more. That growth can sometimes become abnormal and grow faster than it should. And in sometimes it can metastasize and then spread to other parts. So this is a, your, your large intestine is very vascular. There's a lot of blood supply to this tube. And so if it spreads, then it can go to other organs. So that's the big concern, which is why they say adding fiber to your diet helps to keep you regular and it helps to move things out of the large intestine that you don't need. You don't need that because it wasn't absorbed. So obviously it's something that wasn't useful to the body. And so that's like the benefit of it. And I will tell you that when I moved here, so I've been here since 95, but in the first couple of years of living here, I was like really, really surprised at like some of the diets of some of my students because I would ask, like I would say like, you know that everybody should poop every day. And I have had students come up to me that say like, I like poop like once a week. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Then, then the discussion, well, why? Like, so then the question is, so do you eat vegetables? No, I don't like vegetables. <laughs> do you eat salad? No, I don't like salads. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> so we start going through and I'm like, you have no fiber in your diet, right? So. I have like, yeah, I like like fried chicken. Okay, well that's grease and that's bread that you digest and that's protein. All of those things, there's absolutely no fiber in it at all, okay? If they eat vegetables, they eat vegetables that have been cooked to their mushy, okay? And if you cook that, you can actually break down some of the insoluble fiber. So that becomes this like discussion. I had a girl came in like in her family, diverticulosis occurred and colon cancer. And she was like, I didn't even know any of this. Like, why is this? And she was like, didn't have a regular bowel movement. Like once, twice a week was normal for her. So like had this whole discussion. She doesn't like like brown bread. No, I don't like brown bread. I like white bread. <laughs> okay. White bread has much lower fiber. So that fiber, the cover on the wheat grain has been pulled off. So all that's left is starch. So this discussion then led to well, try to add this. What about that? Would you eat this? So like we had this whole discussion. I finally was like, there's a cereal called toasted oatmeal squares and they taste pretty good and they don't taste like you're eating like wood bark. <laughs> and so she was like, all right. So she started adding like, she just added like a cup of that to her, to her daily diet. She like worked up. And at the end of the semester, she said, no, I poop like three times a week now. <laughs> I've, I've never done that ever before in my life. I didn't think that that was, I thought that was completely normal. And I was like, if you have a family history of colon cancer, diverticulosis, which is where you get like little pockets in the large intestine, if you have that, you really want to try and make sure that you get fiber regularly in your diet just to make sure that like basically everything's getting pushed through as time goes on. All right, now it's, oh, now it's back. <laughs> okay, so those are just showing sort of the three different kinds. So we've got amylose and amylopectin from plants, but those are always like the grain. It's the inside of the vegetable. That's where you're gonna find your starches. The inside of the seeds, the potatoes, inside of the rice. Cellulose is always the outside cover. So if like, 
that's like hysterical. So my significant other, he is like, like if he eats the sweet potato, he eats the potato and he like throws away the peel. And I'm like, that's like the best part. And he was like, no, it tastes like dirt. Like he doesn't like, he doesn't like potato skins. And I'm like, that's where all the fiber is. You should like throw the inside out and just eat the outside. <laughs> but like my dogs are hysterical. That is their favorite part. The skin on a potato, like a sweet potato, like you roll it up and they act like you're giving them candy. It's because there's a little bit of sweet potato, which is really sweet tasting to them. So they eat the peel too. So, but that's the difference between. So when you think of amylose and amylopectin, always think of that starchy interior to the vegetable or grain. Cellulose is always the outside cover. So you can get more fiber by eating like the outside of the apple, not peeling your apple, actually eating the the cover on the apple, eating vegetables that are really crunchy. The whole reason they're crunchy is because of cellulose. When you cook vegetables till they're mushy, then a lot of that soluble fiber dissolves and it's in the water that you boiled it in. Most people don't drink that. Most people like pour that off and then serve the vegetables with some more butter on it. <laughs> okay. So that's just sort of like the normal Southern diet is really like not too much coleslaw is about the only thing, you know, like at Parker's that you're like, okay, so there's some fiber in the coleslaw and that's all. <laughs> Pretty much nothing else. Because even their potatoes are already peeled. Their potatoes come completely peeled. So I'm like, so there's a lot of starch and carbohydrates and fats in there. But I'm like, there's not very much in terms of fibrous. <laughs> so you have to eat like twice as much co uh, coleslaw. <laughs> you're going to get any of the mix. All right, last topic in this chapter. So last topic in this chapter is about blood types. So maybe you know, so if you take an A and P, maybe you know what your blood type is. Does everybody know what their blood type is? No? No? Okay. I, I really just need to start doing this in lab because I'm not sure that they do this anymore anywhere else. But, so blood type is, you've probably heard, like, maybe you know if you're A, you're B, you're AB, or you're O. Okay, so we're really not talking about the positive and negative, like I'm O positive, but we're just talking about like what the letter designation means. So the ABO markers are actually talking about carbohydrates that are on the surface of your red blood cells. So there are sugar groups on the surface. So here are four of the possible sugar groups, and you don't have to remember what their structures are or even their names, but there's galactose. You've heard that before. There's a couple of odd ones. One's called fucose. Notice that it's like, it's carbon six is odd. Carbon six doesn't have an, an alcohol group on it. There's N-acetylgalactosamine, which has like a strange nitrogen group and a, um, it's like an amide on the end there. And then the one N-acetylglucosamine um, is kind of like a glucose with a little amide on there as well. So those ones are like these four sugars. So if you are type A, well, I'll give you type O first. So if you're type O, so this is me. If you're type O, your red blood cell has a set of three sugars attached to its surface. So that means I've got like a whole bunch. So I've got three sugars, three sugars. And I don't mean like you only have one of these. Like the surface of my red blood cell has these three sugars on it. So lots of them. On the red blood cell. This is your R, B, C. Okay, so you got lots of groups of three. So the three is that N-acetylglucosamine. It's kind of like a, a, a lilac, a light purple. Then you have galactose, which is orange, and then you have fucose, which is yellow. So we have this kind of like light purple, orange, yellow pattern. My immune system knows that pattern. So my immune system cells, my white blood cells, which are in floating around with my red blood cells, my white blood cells bounce up against red blood cells all the time. And they're always feeling other cells because they're always looking for things that don't belong. So I'm type O. So my white blood cells bounce up against these three sugars and they're like, yep, that's normal. Bounce up against another one. That's normal. And they just move all around constantly feeling. But if you're type A, you have what I have. So do you see that type A has the same three, the light purple, orange, and yellow, but they have an extra. So if you look at their red blood cells, the surface on their red blood cells, 
They got a blood cell. They got the same three. But now they got an extra. So they actually have the normal pattern of three, just like O, but they got this extra one. It's the light yellow one. Okay? So that pattern, does it match mine? No. So if I, as a type O person, if I get type A blood, my immune system cells, my white blood cells, bounce up against this carbohydrate pattern, and it's like, mm -mm, no, <laughs> this is not supposed to be here. And this will actually trigger an immune response. My white blood cells will attack and destroy type A blood cells because I'm type O. So if it's not the same, if it has anything different, then it's going to be rejected. And that's the reason why when they give somebody a transfusion, they want to type their blood. If you're type B, you don't match A and you don't match O. If you're type B, do you notice they have the same basic three carbohydrates on their red blood cells that all of them have, like O has, but they actually have an extra galactose. So that extra galactose is, again, would make it look different to me. So I'm type O. I cannot get type A because that fourth sugar is weird. I cannot get type B because that second galactose would be trigger an immune response. So type O, I can't get A blood. I cannot get B blood because they have a sugar that doesn't exist on mine. So what do you think type AB people are? Well, what do you think their red blood cells look like? Mm -hmm. So if they're AB, type AB actually has two different kinds of sugar groups. They have a group just like A and a group just like B. So they'll their red blood cells will have the ones that look just like A, the set of four that looks just like A, and it'll have the set of four that looks just like B. So type AB has both groups of sugars on their red blood cells. So if I'm type O, can I get that? No. So that would be completely foreign to me. So no A, no B, no AB for type O people. But what can I get? I can only get O. <laughs> okay? So being type O, you can only get O because I have kind of like the simplest pattern. So no fancy patterns for me. It's got to be just the simplest pattern. But, so what about type A? Can they get type B? No. So they cannot get type B because you see it's not the same. So it would look different. What about AB? Could they get type AB? Mm -hmm. So if I'm A, if I got AB, that means I'd get some B. So I'd get some sugar combinations like B. So that would be foreign as well. So I cannot get B or AB if I'm type A. I can't get anything with a B, basically. What if you're type B? You can't get anything with what? A. Mm -hmm. So B cannot be transfused with type A or AB because it's got that weird N-acetyl galactosamine, the light yellow one that wouldn't match. What if you're type AB? What can you get? So type AB has the pattern of A and the pattern of B. Mm -hmm. And? A, B, AB, and O. So they can get anything. Nothing is foreign to the type AB. So I think of them as being like, they're the universal receiver. You can give any blood to AB because they have the pattern of A, they have the pattern of B. Now think about the pattern of O. 
Do all the blood types have the pattern of O? They all have, do you see they all have the three? So if I give O to A, it'll have the same pattern of three. A has an extra one, but their white blood cells will still see the same, the basic three. That is why O can be given to anybody. It is sort of the simplest pattern. And so it's a, fa it's a pattern found in all blood types. And that's why they call O what? They're the universal donor. And if you go get blood and they type your blood and you are type O, they will call you incessantly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally, like I had surgery and I was like, I don't think I should be giving blood like after surgery and anesthesia. And I'm like still trying to get through all this. So she was like, all right, well, I'll just put you off for 12 weeks. We'll call you. And so they have already. They've started back because I had it in the end of November. So December, January, February. Now here we are beginning of March. And I've already gotten a couple phone calls this week. So, I mean, I go and get blood regularly. It doesn't bother me. I don't have any problems with it, but I'm an, I'm O positive. And so that means that they can give my blood to type A, type B, type O, type AB. As long as it's positive, they can give it to it. So it's in pretty high demand and need. And so I think with COVID and stuff, people kind of like stopped giving blood. So like their resources have really been decreased. So it's a much bigger issue. But that's really where it comes from. So O has the basic, think of type O, it has the basic pattern of three that all blood types have. That's why you can give O to anybody and it won't reject. AB has all the possible patterns. So you can give blood to any, to any blood to AB and they're good. They won't go through any kind of rejection. You have roughly, you have say six pints, six liters of blood that's in your body completely, about a gallon and a half. That's about as much. The more rare is AB. Mm -hmm. AB is the most rare. B is the next. A is then like next to the most common. O is the most common. O and AB. And it does depend on populations too. So different populations, type A may be more prevalent than type O. But it just depends on like your heritage. Like if you're European versus being African versus like my mother is Native American. Everybody in my family is type O. <laughs> it's like extremely common amongst Native Americans, type O. Like that's, you just don't ever see, people are an AB, they're, like, what? <laughs> they're just not. So, and it's, I mean, it is genetically determined between parents, but so my father's O, my mother's O, so we're all O, everybody in our family. So just remember, O has the basic pattern of carbohydrates and that's why it can be given to anybody. It's the universal donor. AB has all the patterns so they can get anybody's blood. They're the universal receiver. If you give blood type A to type B, so if you give blood to a patient that does not match that blood type, then rejection will cause destruction of those red blood cells. So I said, you have your body, an adult human, has about somewhere between five and six liters. So we'll say like one and a half gallons of blood. If they transfuse more than 20% of your blood, so if you get really much more than a pint, if you get more, well, like, which is basically like a unit. So, you know, if you go give blood, they like collect it in a little bag. So it's a certain amount, they call it a unit. So a unit really is very close to a pint. So if you transfuse a person with more than 10 to 20% of their blood volume and it's the wrong type, then this can cause blood cell destruction, which can then lead to liver failure and kidney failure because the destroyed blood, blood cells end up clogging your filtering organs. So your liver and kidneys filter out stuff so they can end up being damaged because of it. So that's why it's really important. That's because they don't want to take your blood. You don't have enough. 
<laughs> you already don't have enough. Mm -hmm. And so that used to be, that's a really common issue for females. And that's because you menstruate. So you lose blood every month that guys don't do. So it oftentimes, like when I was younger, not so much now, but when I was younger, it really like would depend on what time of the month. If it was just before my period, I could go donate blood. But if it was just after, I might come back looking anemic. Like they wouldn't like, they'd actually say, oh, your blood's not the that they have to measure the density of your blood to make sure there's enough red blood cells so that you would be okay to donate. So some people, especially, especially little girls, like little stature girls can oftentimes be like borderline anemic. And so they might not let them donate blood. Just depends on what your, how much red blood cells you have. So mismatch of blood can actually be life-threatening. So there is like a chart that shows, and this chart's actually correct. So notice that all the blood types can get O. AB can get anything. But AB can only give to AB. So I'm telling you, if you're type AB, the Red Cross is like, yeah, okay, thanks. Because you can't give their blood to anybody but AB. Right. So all of those are limit. The only one that can AB can can give blood only to AB, but O can give, be given to anybody. So this is that universal donor, all types. And O and A are the most common. So if you're type A, then your blood is pretty useful because that means that you can donate. If you're type A, then you can donate to A, you, which is real common. You could donate to AB. But O is by far and large. I can attest to that. I really do have to call them back and make the appointment.